and told Radio Network fans, want exclusive perks and to support our channel? Introducing our YouTube membership program with three amazing levels. Get loyalty badges that level up to different cryptids the longer you're a supporter. How cool is that? You'll also get access to custom Bigfoot emojis and priority in chat. Upgrade to Backstage Pass for exclusive wallpapers, photos, status updates, discounted books, and merchandise. Go all in with the producer level for everything mentioned plus member shoutouts. Ready for an enhanced experience? Join now, pick your membership level, and let's make this journey even more exciting together. UFOs, monsters, mysteries, you're listening to Talking Weird. And now, from a cabin deep in the Northwoods, your host, Dr. Dean Bertram. Greetings to all my fellow weirdos and weirdettes. Thank you for joining me for Talking Weird on the Untold Radio Network. I hope everybody's getting for, ready for Halloween. I know I am. I'm harvesting the last of my pumpkins from my patch here in the North Woods. And while we're talking about Halloween, it might be worth mentioning that if you watch and listen to Talking Weird live every Saturday night at 10 p.m. Central on the Untold Radio Network, we're actually moving as of Halloween, as of October the 31st, to that Tuesday at 9 p.m. And going forward, we will always be playing at that time. So you can still watch the show at any time you want to on any or listen to it on any podcast platform and go back and watch the archived video. But I'm hoping that you will all follow over to that time with me. Tonight, I'm super excited about the guest that I have. I always say I'm super excited, but this is a very special guest with a very special book, which I think is going to have a profound impact on the way that we look at the history of UFOs and flying saucers. He was born in London and he's lived in Spain since 1991, where he teaches English. He started his journey into exploring UFO history in his early teens and has collaborated with some of the best minds in the field. He is the founder of the historical research group, Magonia Exchange, an international archival project with members in 10 different countries. He's an author and co-author of a number of books, including Wonders in the Sky with Jacques Vallée, Return to Magonia with Martin Schoff, Uparts, Sonales, and Viages Inexplicables. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And of course, Alien Artifacts. He lectures widely and regularly contributes to radio programs in both English and Spanish. His brand new book, Sources, Tracing the Origins of Disc-Shaped Craft, is, as I was saying at the very beginning, one of the most significant books on the topic I have ever read. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to Talking Weird, Chris Orbeck. Hi there. It's great to have you here, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on to do the show. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure, and I wanted to to meet you because we've spoken several times now through through Twitter and Messenger and so yes. on. And I think we have some very very similar ideas and uh, uh, interests in this field. I do too. It was a joy talking to you previously over the various socials, but now I've got, I've got to talk to you properly the first time since I've read your book and. I'll be honest, since I finished my PhD research in the mid 2000s, and I, I walked away from the UFO topic for a while, but when I came back, I was very conscious that there hadn't been, I thought, hardly any books of real worth or merit published. Now, in fairness, I haven't read your Alien Artifacts because that dropped after my dissertation as well. But I think, I, I say this with all sincerity, I think the three most important books I've re read about UFOs written in the 21st century, and they're very different. They're about different aspects of the phenomenon. But one would be Greg Bishop's wonderful Project Beta. The other would be Joshua Cutchin's recent Ecology of Souls. And now I'm happy to add your sources, tracing the origins of disc-shaped UFOs to that list, because it's it really is a revolutionary look at how 
we got these this idea of flying saucers and it's very different to what most people even myself thought so maybe if you could could you kind of give an overview of the traditional idea that how kenneth arnold's language and perhaps the misunderstanding of how he described saucer supposedly had was what triggered off the term flying saucer and then we can go into what you've discovered from there onwards well we have to remember that um the idea of ufos didn't exist exactly until the 24th of june 1947 when um this pilot and businessman from 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 boys uh idaho decided to um track down a missing military plane uh because he was he wanted a a cash reward i think it was five thousand dollars he was out there looking for this plane when uh he saw nine strange objects and nine's interesting in the sense that most ufo sightings these days only involve one so it was like a flock of ufos that he saw then he um when he landed uh his first interview was at the east oregonian with uh, two journalists uh, nolan skiff and william beckett who wrote a couple of articles um explaining what he'd seen the the first version of 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 the articles was very very short and just said that he'd seen objects that uh, were saucer like and um were flat like a pie pan uh but it didn't actually say what shape they were because we have to remember that pie pan and saucer like were not really shape adjectives they were just well I, I can explain a little bit about that in a moment that, that's what caused the confusion um but it was the second interview that he did um with uh, william beckett once they realized that this news had a lot of traction to it um in which he said that uh, they were bat shaped however that's not um that's not what uh, what got communicated through the uh, associated press to the rest of the country everyone fixated on the idea of saucer like and pie pan uh, flat like a pie pan and they thought well they must be discs and um so the whole the whole world came to the conclusion that this man had seen disc shaped objects which they very quickly dubbed flying saucers and then uh, shortly after that arnold began showing his um well he, he wasn't particularly happy with the with the name flying saucer because he knew that he hadn't seen anything of that shape and it was only like three years later uh, when he reached the conclusion and publicly stated that it had all been a misunderstanding that he had said that the objects had moved like saucers skimming over water it was with this kind of, of uh, undulating uh, move, movement and um and that's how he believed the rumor started that they had been saucer shaped or circular and flat and that's the the way things have been uh, over the last uh, let's say 60 or 70 years uh people believed arnold's story so we have on the one hand we have um uh, the general idea that flying saucers are round and flat and on the other hand we have the the idea that the original witness said no that's a mistake what i saw was a different shape altogether they were like half moons crescent moons whatever and in ufology we've had the two ideas coexisting mysteriously at the same time uh, and uh, th this is this is what what brought me to to this question i wanted to find an answer to it how can ufologists on the one hand understand that arnold never saw never said he'd seen saucer shaped objects and at the same time um believe that most alien spaceships are are round and flat it seemed to be a contradiction it's a wonderful piece of social and cultural history and linguistic or language history as well your book and i think your 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 strengths are all over there but your strength of of nutting down the language is phenomenal i'll be honest i did and i'm somebody who like i said has a phd in this field there was large swathes of your book i had no previous knowledge to it all i believe even when i did my dissertation i think there was another dissertation out there that all it did was talk about how 
that original misidentification of, of shape was the responsibility of headline writers and how that had then transposed and all of its effect it has. But you trace the popularity of the word flying saucers very, very convincingly because not only is your book, and we'll get to the out later, beautifully written, the illustrations and the extracts from various magazines and papers and pulp fiction and photographs and the like is extraordinary. So it's illustrated with news clippings and examples, hundreds of them, of the usage of flying saucers long before anybody considered them to be alien spacecraft from another world or anomalous aircraft vehicles or whatever people first thought they were. This word dates back and it was very significant in America or parts of American culture. So perhaps um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that discovery. Yeah, so um, if you if you look up uh, flying saucer in in standard dictionaries, and of course, uh, being British myself, I originally uh, consulted the Oxford English Dictionary a very long time ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago. It it states and state it is stated then and still does that that flying saucer had been coined in 1947 as a result of Kenneth Arnold's sighting. Uh, however, when I started looking into this question uh, around the year 2004, I realized that flying saucer, exactly with those with those words, um, emerged uh, 10 years before his sighting, 20 years before his sighting, but always in the context of sport, because in 1880, um, a man uh, uh who wanted to to help trap shooters continue with the sport uh despite the fact that live bird shooting had been prohibited tried to come up with a device an artificial device that they could toss into the air and would explode on impact um he invented um a clay disc which um, it looks very similar to a flying saucer, in fact, that when launched into the air, you could shoot, it would explode, and it wouldn't cause any kind of ecological damage. Until that point, they'd experimented with glass balls and, and other things made of glass in general because it was light and would break easily. But, of course, that scattered glass shards everywhere. So um, when George Ligowski... Um, invented um, the clay pigeon as we as we know it today. It totally revolutionized the sport. And by 1883, 1885, 1889, everybody was talking about this device. And one of its names, one of the most popular names for it, was a flying saucer because it looked like a saucer. So when we reach the 1890s, uh, the early 1900s, because trap shooting was so popular as a sport in the United States and in the rest of the world, the expression flying saucer was on everybody's lips. It was something that you could find in sports pages, in sports events. Um, people were buying hundreds of thousands of flying saucers um, because it was a sport that was more, more popular than golf and, and tennis and f football and every other sport at that point. So that means that for decades and decades before Arnold's sighting, people were incredibly aware of the expression fr flying saucer. Then when World War II happened, um, the, the American government decided to, to stop the production of um, flying saucers and, and um, ammunition for this important national sport and use it all for the war effort. Um, however, they decided to, to take advantage of the, of the existence of flying saucers to use it for training uh, for themselves, for, the, for their gunners, so they could so they could train their pilots to shoot down enemy aircraft uh, over Germany. And around 1944, um, the American military started publishing articles in all newspapers in the United States saying, well, we've stopped 
the sport. Very sorry about that. But we're looking for people to help us teach our soldiers to uh, to shoot flying saucers, which is why suddenly you find in the mid 1940s the expression flying saucer used in a military context. And of course, uh, Kenneth Arnold's sighting was just three years later. So um, obviously people remembered very, very well the, the expression flying saucer, its military association, and 60 years of, of its usage in trap shooting and skeet. After 1947, that is to say after Kenneth Arnold's sighting, um, the word flying saucer became so associated with UFOs that journalists decided not to use it anymore in reference to, to trap shooting and skeet. So then they started using other synonyms that had already existed, like clay pigeons or simply clay discs. And after maybe 10, 10 years more, 20 years more, nobody remembered that flying saucer had, had originally been coined for the sport. And when I made a website explaining this around the year 2006, a lot of ufologists uh, criticized the idea saying, how could it possibly, how could the sport possibly have any connection with, with ufology? And in the end, I just let the website die. But, um, Recently, the Oxford English Dictionary has contacted me to say they'd like to use my research into this to update and amend wow. their history of the expression flying saucer for the new edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. So obviously they can see the evolution of the expression from, from sport straight into ufology. That, that's how it happened. And um, it's not every day that that a major dictionary uh, is happy to listen to a ufologist and <laughs> and amend its definition, is it? But the point is that I make in the book that when Kenneth Arnold, um, he probably or maybe used the word saucer in reference to something else in that interview, maybe the movement, maybe it's 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 flatness. Because at that time, these days people say as flat as a pancake, but there was a time when people said as flat as a saucer, as flat as a pie pan. And these are the expressions that ended up in newspapers and people associated with his sighting because nobody remembered that he'd said bat, bat shaped. Um, they, they latched on to this very popular expression, flying saucer, that had, be, that had been a part of, of, of human culture for 60 years. And that's how the popularization of flying saucer started. Everyone just said, ha, ah, you saw a flying saucer, that's so funny, in reference to the sport. But then whenever you had a new witness, they'd say, I've seen a flying saucer too. It was, they looked like a saucer. So this is the main thesis of my, of my book, I suppose. No, I, I absolutely was just, like I said, fascinated by it. And I find it so interesting, as you mentioned briefly there, but it's talked about a little more in the book, how when that initial story got picked up by the AP Newswire, they dropped the bat wing reference from it altogether and Completely. they only left the saucer reference. And so mm -hmm. another thing I'd never thought about before, I'd always followed the traditional kind of explanation that newspaper writers or headline writers had taken the movement moving like source a saucer would if you skipped it across water as arnold later said uh was what he what he meant and just shortened it to saucer like or to to flying saucers but i never ever thought about the fact that the the word saucer might have been used as a descriptor of the width of it or the flatness of it i found that mm -hmm. and you mentioned that then that was absolutely fascinating i never even thought about that just quickly while we're on the flying saucer trap skating connection i was reading the book yesterday at my daughter's home school group and i have a, a friend there who's the coordinator of it actually he's interested in these things in a, a very kind of marginal way he's also a shooter as most people are in my neck of the woods and i showed him the book and i just said you have no idea where this term originated from and i said both you and i should know it 
because we're sportsmen. And he looked at me straight away. And I, this is the first time other than your book, anyone's ever said that. And he said, yeah, trap shooting. And I said, how okay. on earth did you know that? And he said, the only reason I know that is my grandfather still sometimes calls them flying saucers. And I said, how old okay. your grandfather? He's in his nineties. And I'm like, that'd make sense. He was calling them flying saucers when he was a young man. But That's before it. your book and before bringing it up to that, my friend, I never heard the reference. So yeah, people, like, there must be, still be old timers who still know those clay pigeons were flying saucers. Yeah, but it was it was completely forgotten. It just shows you um, how delicate language is in a sense, because just from one generation to the next, uh, a word can completely change its meaning. I, I find that now I live in Spain, when I go back to England, uh, I, I hear my mother or a friend use a, a term, and I think I know what it means until suddenly I realize, you know, it's changed. It's changed maybe in five years, it's changed in 10 years. Then you have people growing up and they only know it with this new, with this new meaning, with this new definition. <laughs> For example, last week my father was here, and um, he said something like, um, oh, I like your pants. And I was like, because huh? in English, of course, uh, that's underpants. Pants ah, means underpants. Gotcha. And suddenly he's using pants with the American <laughs> meaning of, of trousers. And I, I was like, why were you looking at my pants? You know? <laughs> and it just shows the fragility of language and how quickly it, it, things can change. In, in this case, it would be because of uh, TV series, American movies, and, and, and so on. But that, that's happened in the life of a man between, let's say, the age of 70 and 82 in a 12-year period, because I know that wow. when he was 70, he would never have said pants. Um, and we can see how quickly things change. Uh, so in 1946, or until May 1947, newspapers were using the word flying saucer every single day to refer to clay discs. From June the 25th onwards, suddenly it only meant alien spaceship. Then after a few months, when the, the original Führer, that sort of... Um, uh, was was caused by by Arnold's sighting. It began to die down. Then journalists went back to using the expression "flying saucer" again in the context of of of, of trap shooting. But it didn't last long because everyone imagined that UFOs would be a fad and that it, it would just disappear from from people's memory very very quickly. But it never did. So. Everybody started using flying saucer only to refer to alien spaceships in the end. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is amazing. And as you point out in the book as well, people tend to, unless maybe they live rurally or maybe in America where there's still quite, you know, a firearm culture, people don't think of trap and skeet shooting being big sports. But as you point out in the book, prior to World War II, these sports were as big as golf and tennis. Like these were mm -hmm. major sports that a lot of people were involved in. So a lot That's of people right. understood that terminology. Moving away from the sources for a minute, though, we mentioned the bat wing descriptor that that Arnold used. Can you talk a little bit about the prevalence of the idea of fixed wing aircraft and bat wing shaped aircraft and flying flapjacks and the like, and how that might have influenced Arnold's language or perhaps might even have influenced what he thought he saw at the time, because certainly right. these things were cutting edge ideas that people were becoming aware of as well. Yeah, exactly. So um, from the 1920s onwards, we find reference to, references to single-winged aircraft, that is to say like one long, long wing, the boomerang idea basically, but um, they never really used the word boomerang in this, in this context, but anyway, it was like a single wing. And we find that throughout the 1920s, 30s and 40s. Um, in the 20s and 30s, it seemed like something that was going to be revolutionary, it was going to revolutionize air transport, the experiments that, they, that they'd that done, the prototypes that they'd built, showed that planes could go much faster uh, if, if they had a single wing. Sometimes it was uh, quite a thin one, as I said, like a boomerang, and sometimes it was uh, slightly wider, like a triangle, but the point was it was a single wing, not, not, a t not two attached to, the, to, 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 to a body in the middle. And um, they consistently used the adjective bat-shaped or bat-like to describe this. So um, you get the, a, a situation in which um, aviation technology became very important to people as computers 
might be today or AI and newspapers or well, aviation technology was very important for a while, uh, particularly because if we think that um, if, if uh, manned flight only started around 1906, as far as airplanes are concerned, then 1920 was just like 14 years later, which is a very short time. If we think of 14 years ago from today, that's a very, very short time. And then, of course, in the 1920s and 30s, you have World War I uh, designs for, for aircraft and how to beat the enemy and what will happen if, if they start designing better aircraft than ours. So it was very important. And lay people, normal people, would read in the newspaper about the latest engineering advances and they would see bat-shaped bat-like constantly and in in the book i show a lot of examples of of this uh, in the 1940s we get to um some some um tv series basically or, or cinema series they, they were serialized uh uh, stories um which involved um bat-shaped aircraft from the future sometimes or other planets or simply incredible inventions by some mad scientist but they were called bat shaped or even simply the bat so we get to mickey mouse um we we have two examples i only put one in the book but um mickey mouse piloted at some point um bat shaped craft and, and flying wing shaped craft um, which were simply single-winged craft from the future. They would, be go they, they would go incredibly fast. It was something that everyone knew that were, was going to happen at some point. So the last one that, uh, that I found, or the second one which I put in the book, this is just a couple of years before Arnold's sighting, is when um, Mickey Mouse flies a craft which resembles very much what Arnold said he saw, even down to the sort of white point in the middle, which is um, what, what, what he's, he used to paint and draw. They had a, a kind of white spot, which he believed was the energy system for, the, for his UFOs. Mickey Mouse used to pilot an object that was practically identical, and it was called the bat. And then uh, towards the end of, of World War II, Northrop, the engineer was trying to design um, a bomber that would travel faster and further than, than any other bomber and would save us all um, in our fight against the Germans. Unfortunately, uh, his design wasn't perfect. It had some flaws and then it was too expensive to make and then it, it took too long. So the war ended before Northrop's design came out. But it was a celebrity in a sense. It was in all of the newspapers all of the time. It was on the cover of, of a lot of magazines. And they constantly said, bat-shaped, bat-like, very batty. They, they used all kinds of, of, of adjectives uh, related to bats. So when Arnold saw his craft and he said in his interview, it was bat-shaped, it, it, was, it wasn't strange, it wasn't illogical, it fit in perfectly well with the aviation terminology of the period. And, and then a second craft that had been invented was called the flying flapjack. And this wasn't exactly a single winged craft, it was eh, more or less, it was sort of a shell shaped craft really, or, or a guitar pick shaped, shaped craft. And um, it was also going to revolutionize transport and aviation. And the interesting thing there is that they used words like saucer shaped. They used they used words um, very very similar to what what Arnold would would come to use in his own descriptions. And all of this influenced him, of course. He'd seen these weird craft that are like 50 miles away. Uh, obviously, he couldn't really make them out properly. So when he came to describe them, he he started using terminology that a, a pilot. Would, would use a pilot interested in in, in um, technological the technological advancements of, of, of his time. So therefore, when he said bat shaped, that was a very important key element to his story. It was bat shaped. If he said saucer like, it was probably to do with flatness. We don't exactly know how he said in, in what context he said saucer like. When he said like a pie pan. Again, it was about flatness because that was the expression used, like today we say as flat as a pancake, but not necessarily round, and um, bat shaped. So when that was omitted from the AP version of, his, of, of, of William Beckett's article, 
it just changed the course of of ufology in that sense yeah, it's just just amazing research. One of my own personal interests, as we probably talked about a little bit, and we'll get to Ray Palmer later. I'm not quite talking about him yet, but we're going to, is the interrelationship between science fiction and ufology. And you do an amazing job. You brought out stories I was totally unaware of going back mm -hmm. into the 19th century about proto-flying source era flying saucer shaped craft in science fiction stories. And you travel with that in a number of chapters all the way up to the pulps. And then of course, to Palmer, but maybe you could talk about some of those earliest stories and, and then lead up that type of fiction into the pulps and how people were already in many ways conditioned to think of flying saucers as being the potential shape of vehicles from aliens from other worlds. Yeah, of course. The, um, the first the first story of importance is um, uh, a novel called uh, Bellona's uh, Husband, which I, I put here. I actually sort of start the chapter with a picture of it. And this was written by William James Rowe. It was published in 1887. And this is the first time that we hear of disc-shaped alien craft, because the whole story, the whole novel, is about the fact that Alien races um, use disc-shaped craft uh, to travel around space from planet to planet. Uh, according to, to the novel, they'd been trying to reach Earth for, for hundreds of years, but they've all, they'd always crashed. So it's also interesting in that sense because we're talking about the, the crash of disc-shaped UFOs Indeed. in 1887. Um, and um, in, in, in the novel, we discover that um, the reason we see so many meteorites is that half of the time it's because they are disc-shaped um, alien spaceships that are trying to reach the Earth but explode in our atmosphere. And, um, of course, the... the before 1887, um, nobody had written about disc-shaped spaceships. And it's pretty obvious to me, although I cannot prove it, that the reason this man wrote about them was because um, everybody was using them in, in sport. Flying saucers, the, the clay version, had become so incredibly popular. It was in practically all magazines and newspapers all the time. Everyone wanted to buy a box of flying saucers. So um, everybody saw these in flight. So it was a, a completely logical idea to make alien spaceships um, with this design. And as I said, we, we don't find this design before the age of trap shooting, before the age of, of, of um, clay pigeons, only afterwards. So that's the first case and the, and the most interesting case, I would say. Um, after that, there, there were several decades in which science fiction began developing this idea, this design. And again, probably because um, everybody was so aware of the flight capabilities of a disc, because it was used all the time as frisbee. Well, fr frisbees were a little bit later, but um, throwing a discus in the Olympics and uh, in, in trap shooting and so on with a, with a clay disc, that it was an obvious choice. So this was developed into a standard spaceship design, which we find in, in science fiction. Uh, in the book, I have examples of, um, uh, for example, a man who was abducted by a flying disc, a disc-shaped spaceship, and taken to another planet. And this parallel between science fiction before Kenneth Arnold uh, and uh, people's claims after 1947 is extremely strong. You can find very deep parallels there. And um, I think that, I mean, as, as I say in the book, um, this kind of thing is often a chicken, a chicken and egg question because which came first, the science fiction or the, or, the, or the sightings? But in this case, we know what came first. The science fiction came first. It predates all of these stories in, uf in ufology by 60 years. You know? So it's a very important element. Um, it, I'm, I'm not the first person to, to, to point out this, this component um, in the prehistory of ufology. But I'm probably the first person to, to, to find a way that it fits in to, to the whole evolution of the field, starting with, with trap shooting, then developing into the use of discs as, as, as alien spaceships, and then 
this predating Arnold. And then, of course, in 1947, people were already mentally prepared for this because they'd seen discs in so many contexts, um, in comic strips and in um, uh, TV serials, sort of Buck Rogers kind of thing. They and Flash Gordon, they were, they were mentally prepared for this. So it wasn't a huge surprise. Now, can we talk a little bit about the involvement of Ray Palmer? Of course, the pulps, as you've mentioned, had already introduced a lot of this type of symbology and a lot of this type of, uh, the, even there were images long before Palmer of things that look like, you know, things which were source of spacecraft in amazing stories and in, in what were the other ones, like Astounding and Wonder Tales. They were, they were in several of them, but certainly something, at least to me, seems to have happened after Palmer became editor of Amazing. And he starts to not only run that type of science fiction too, but he starts to play around with Fortean ideas all the time. He starts to talk about the potential of alien visitation. So maybe we can talk, maybe we would like to chat a little bit about, I suppose, Palmer's involvement up until the sources. And then afterwards, we can maybe chat a little bit about his influence after mm -hmm. that initial Kenneth Arnold sighting. Yeah, because, um, of course, uh, Kenneth Palmer, who became the editor of Amazing Stories, um, he was um, he loved to sell a good story. He was looking for a, a running theme for his for his magazines, and he was fascinated by the by the the, the Richard Shaver um, idea, story, myth which is about this uh, subterranean world of mysterious creatures with advanced technology who sometimes interact with 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 terrestrials and and so on so the shaver mystery had been very popular for several years before kenneth arnold came on the scene and and palmer became pretty obsessed with it and i think that what, what he wanted to do was to create um, this sort of running theme so he could create a fan base around a particular story. So um, until 1947, most of his um, articles and letters and so on in, in Amazing Stories seemed to touch on this, uh, this Shaver mystery, it was called, uh, which is very interesting, of course, and it involves Lemuria and involves all kinds of, of crazy things. Of course, he himself, wrote most of it or part of it or edited at least um the articles that were sent to him by by richard shaver and um because he knew what he knew how to write a good story which is something that we can see later on too when he comes to write this book in 1952 the coming of the sources with kenneth arnold he changed so many details in this book just to make it more exciting he he he, he changed the timeline he changed the conversations this guy knew how to write. Uh, so um, when we get to 1947, people have got a little bit tired of the Shaver mystery. Nobody really believed it anymore. It just seemed, seemed too far-fetched. Um, Richard Shaver also was a very strange character. He wasn't, he wasn't an enigmatic type that Arnold was. Uh, so Palmer couldn't really use Shaver for his you know, in the, in the, as a kind of celebrity, he couldn't turn the man himself into a celebrity as as you could with uh, Kenneth Arnold or Whitley Stryber or whoever. You know, I mean, over the years we've seen so many like that. So um, there was a point when Palmer became fascinated by the possibility that extraterrestrials were going to visit us or were already visiting us. So he began to insert um, references to possible UFO sightings that, have, that had happened in the 1930s and the 1940s. And um, when it got to 1947, um, he'd already said that around that period, uh, the world would experience a visit from extraterrestrials. It was just a strange, crazy prediction. He made a lot of weird predictions and he was never normally right. But suddenly, of course, Kenneth Arnold came on the scene and it was as if all his Christmases had come together. It was like, oh my God, this is, this is perfect for my, for my magazine. I'm going to jump onto the Kenneth Arnold 
bandwagon, basically, and I'm going to ride this story and milk it as much as I can. So suddenly, he, he sort of abandoned the, the shaver mystery, and everybody was probably quite appreciative of the fact. They've got very tired of it. And suddenly, Kenneth Arnold and his flying saucers were the, um, were the buzzwords of the day. Um, then, of course, years later, uh, John Keel said that it seemed as if Ray Palmer had invented flying saucers because Palmer had popularized the idea of flying saucers to such a huge extent to increase sales of his in, of his magazine. Uh, but the the point I make in the in the book isn't that um, Palmer invented flying saucers. What he did was reinvent Kenneth Arnold because almost immediately he contacted Kenneth Arnold. He said, I love your story. I love everything that you do. Please send me your own version of it. Send me some photos of it. I will pay you. And Kenneth Arnold was a, was a, was a businessman uh, first and foremost. Uh, so he, he obviously loved the idea of being paid for something that, that, that he really wanted to do. And suddenly the world was paying attention to him. He had a, he had a place to talk about his, his, his sighting and his opinions. Uh, that, that would be Palmer's magazine. And uh, when Palmer left Amazing Stories to set up Fate, which still exists today, um, he, he said, OK, um, I'm going to send you on a little mission. You're going to investigate this case in, in Maury Island. Uh, it seems like something very strange has happened there. And of course, he paid for his expenses and so on. And bit by bit, Palmer and Arnold became good friends through this sort of business relationship they had. And at the same time, of course, Palmer supported Arnold in absolutely everything um, he did. So it, 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 the, it, in, in a sense, Palmer really did invent the field of flying saucers uh, in a way, because of course, then, then Kenneth Arnold started his own organization, uh, his own UFO club, uh, but really, I think that this was mainly linked to, to Palmer's enterprises because what you got in exchange for paying membership, for, for paying for your membership in Arnold's club, it was no meetings, no conferences, no newsletter, nothing at all. But what you did receive was a subscription to, to, to Ray Palmer's magazine. So it, it, it looks as if they were working together, you know, these, these two men. I love the, I love um, that there's this moment in history where you get a pulp publisher, pulp, rather a pulp editor, and then a publisher of course his own magazines, including Flying Sources before or after Fate, and you get a witness, Kenneth Arnold, and you also have Richard Shaver, who you talked about, and these three men kind of in a weird way come together. Like they meet and as you talk about in the book, Arnold sold both uh, Shaver and Palmer stocks in his failed uranium company. It hadn't failed yet, but it went on to fail. So there's this very strange, as as just as, as a tale of humanity, as a tale of people, forget about the incredible culture, which perhaps they were all involved in creating. It's this very strange relationship between, between these men, which absolutely fascinates me. But I could talk to you about uh, about Arnold and Palmer and Shaver forever, and perhaps we we will talk about it more at another time. But what I find interesting in your book, amongst everything, but is towards the end, you make a few suggestions on perhaps why people think they see flying sources, and how perhaps this beyond the initial the the spread in the language of the term flying sources, how there's still this idea that people see flying sources, and sometimes, although you point out it's not a major actual percentage of people who witness these strange things, but still there can be people who see these things and you have a number mm. of reasons and why somebody who has an anomalous sight a sighting of something anomalous why they might come to a flying saucer you know conclusion that that's what they saw could you talk a little yeah. bit about some of that as well because that's that's as fascinating as anything else in there so i think the first point to make is that um people people don't really realize how few ufos are actually disc shaped so um, what I do in the book, in the, in the first chapter, I establish the fact that um, before Kenneth Arnold, only 1%, no, it's less than 1%, but it's convenient to say 1% of, of UFOs were disc-shaped. In, in reality, it's about 0.02% I calculated. Uh, because um, with all of the, I mean, wow. through my, my, my group, Magonia Exchange, we've collected a massive amount of, of, of sightings, historical sightings. 
But then you have all the other databases that have been created over the decades, and you have all the statistics that have been drawn from that. And yeah, it's before Arnold, it was like 0.02% of, of, of sightings were, um, were disc shaped. And then during the UFO craze that Arnold started, um, practically all of them were flying saucer shaped. And then from around the late 80s, 90s onwards, um, flying saucers became pretty old hat. And it, 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 it sort of became almost funny to say that you'd seen a, a flying saucer in, 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 in some circles. Um, it had become a part of culture, which is why the Millennium Falcon has the shape that it does, because the person charged with um, designing it was told, make it more or less like a flying saucer. The, 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 the Enterprise in Star Trek, uh, that design also comes from a flying saucer, it just has a, a long appendage attached to it. But really, the idea of flying saucers sort Sort of became an old-fashioned concept that not even NASA was interested in. The whole idea of of, of uh, how how do flying saucers work? What's their propulsion propulsion system? You know, I mean, it was it was abandoned pretty early on as a bad design, as was the flying wing and the and the flying flapjack. Uh, so, what, a point that I make is that over the last uh, 30 years, um, the percentage of, of disc-shaped sightings has gone down to about, it's about 2% now at this point, uh, according to the, the best databases that there are that have hundreds and hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of cases registered. And people don't realize that normally because we still associate um, the disc right. with alien spaceships, which is why on my book, I've had to put a, a disc on here, otherwise nobody will know it's, w w what it's about. I need to, to, to put a, a flying saucer on the cover of the book. If you buy a t-shirt about aliens or flying saucers, you will find a disc, you'll find a flying saucer and an alien shape or whatever, an alien body, like a gray. Absolutely. That's a That's a subject for another day where the grays come from. But um, uh, the fact is that uh, it's become a shorthand for for alien spaceships. So what happens is when people make a, a report, they often say that they've seen a weird thing in the sky. And when they get to the registration form, they will tick the box that says disk, even if it wasn't a disk. And you can see that because when you go into online um, uh, UFO databases, and you can see the, the reports that the people have filed, they will tick the, the saucer box, the disk box, but then they'll, they'll talk about a diamond shape or an amorphous light or a cloud or, wow. or, or just nothing. And, and it's, it's nuts in that sense. It's like, so why did you call it a disk? And it's because we have this instinct to call alien spaceships just saucers and disks. So um, what I do as you said, towards the end of the book is I give a, um, a sort of list of reasons why people mm, think that they've seen a disc or reported it as a disc, even when it probably wasn't. So the first one I mentioned in the book is uh, perceptual expectancy. And that's because our brains are, are hardwired to expect to see a disc shape when we've seen a UFO. I've seen cases of people who only saw a star. That, that's all they saw in the sky, a star. But then when they've come to draw it or describe it, they've drawn a disc, they've drawn a flying saucer, huh. you know, and they only saw a tiny little dot in the sky that later they've discovered was maybe, I don't know, uh, a star or Venus or Jupiter, but they've drawn a disc for the ufologist. So that's because our, our brains are hardwired to, to, to look for, to sort of express it in the in the in in disc terms in discoid terms then uh very similar to that is a confirmation bias which i've which i've written which um it's it, it's it's the idea that you have a pre-existing belief it's very similar to percept perceptual expectancy but again um you will reject any any data uh, about a about a sighting even if it's your own sighting that contradicts the idea that it was disc shaped and it sounds crazy that, that we would do that, but um, if you go online and you look in, in, the, in the online databases, that is what you find. You find it says saucer, fly, flying saucer. Man sees disc flying over California, over San Francisco, but then you would get down to the details and it was bullet shaped or whatever. Yeah? Wow. 
Um, then you have, of course, false memory syndrome, which is the next the next category that I, I talk about. Because no matter what you what you saw at the time, when the way that our memories work is that um, we don't remember what we saw exactly. We recreate the memory every time we remember something, and this is um, a well known uh, fact in in neuroscience. You don't remember the moment. You remember the memory of the moment and that and every time you remember something it changes slightly um i saw a i saw a, a ufo uh, in on on the 6th of april 1996 and i've been in a thousand different interviews and they ask me all the time what i saw and i try to say what i saw using the same words it was it was rectangle it was orange it was self luminous it was in the sky it disappeared after 5 or 10 minutes it reappeared in a different part of the sky but I will always use the same words because I am so aware of the fact that if not, it will change in my memory. I don't want it. To, I don't want to lose that experience. But I'm aware of the fact that I'm only remembering now my last recreation, mental recreation of that thing. We don't remember events. We, we remember memories, and that is really dangerous. And then, of course, uh, pareidolia is 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 the last category that that I've I've mentioned here. Um, quite often, we will look at something and believe we're seeing something. Um, but in fact, for example, if you see a face, like a, a coffee stain, it looks like um, a face or something like that. You say, oh, it looks like a face. That's a pareidolia. That's because we, we see something that really isn't that, but it very slightly resembles it. So a lot of the time, people believe they've seen a disc-shaped UFO. Um, but if you actually had a photo or a video of it, you'd be able to show that it had a completely different shape. Um, so, yeah, those are the those are the basic reasons why people can believe they've seen disc-shaped objects when they when they hadn't done. Uh, another another important fact, of course, is that as flying saucer was such um, a useful little expression to describe to describe alien spaceships and UFOs in general. As we go back through time, 1940s, 1950s, and so on, 1960s, and I, I put a lot of examples in the book, people saw crescent shapes, they saw cigar shapes or whatever, but the headline was always flying saucer. And that's had a massive impact on, on culture, simply because of lazy headline writing, you know. So, um, yeah, uh, at, at, at the same time, I must say that if 2% of UFOs are disc-shaped, that's great too. Uh, you know, I mean, if you've seen a UFO and it was disc shaped, I'm not going to disagree with you. There are lots right. of reasons why you, it might not be true, but you know, maybe you're one of the lucky 2%. Maybe I've often thought, and I've actually, I actually talked about a little bit of, in my dissertation that when you can see that the trope of a bright light in the sky, when it comes closer, becoming, a saucer has been so normalized in science fiction films since at least the day the earth stood still where at first it's a light. And then as it comes closer, it's the classic saucer shaped thing, which lands, you know, on the Washington mall. And it got to such a point where that so is associated in people's mind, bright, strange light in the distance equals flying saucer that more recent television and film writers have been able to play with audience expectations. So in the X-Files, you'd see that bright light. Oh, it's a saucer and the music, you know, rises and then the music drops and you hear the thumping sound of helicopters. So the audience has been tricked just by the expectation that they're mm. also used to a bright light in the distance, which nobody knows what it is. It's a saucer. So I think that probably, as you were saying, has to play into people seeing a strange anomalous light. Science fiction has been telling them since, at least film science fiction has been telling them since the 50s, maybe as you were talking about serials even going back to the 30s. And if you look at some of the art and literature you were talking about previously to that, going back even further, that yeah, that's the expectation of an anomalous light in the sky. And but talking... we can we can talk about the fact that in the in the past people used to see um comets and meteors, and a few people were very scientific in their descriptions, but 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 farmers, just the sort of people who lived in the area, would often say how it looked like a human head, or it looked like the gods fighting in the sky, or it looked like a sword, or it looked like whatever. And then when they came to paint it or draw it, they'd say it was a sword. 
I know it was a sword. It was the sword of God. So suddenly, a sword with the handle and everything, the whole hilt, that was what they saw. In fact, it wasn't what they saw because we actually have pieces of those meteorites half the time. But, but um, the idea is that they were painting, uh, they, they, they drew and they described and they used terminology about swords. You know, the, 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 the hilt, the point, the whatever, the blade. They didn't see a sword. And it's exactly the same thing in the case of, of flying saucers. People will describe all kinds of stuff about it. The dome on top, the landing lights, whatever you want. But in reality, that's not what they saw. It might be what they think they remember they saw, but it's 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 not what they it's not what they saw. While we're talking about art and the like, I just have to commend you on this book. Not not only is it just an incredible and illuminating read, I think it's the most enjoyable read just from an aesthetic perspective I can imagine that I can remember since reading comic books in my teens. There's so many illustrations in there. It's almost every, it's so it, there's so many illustrations in there that when I hit a page where there wasn't an illustration, I was like, oh, that's weird. There's no <laughs> illustration on this page. Of course, there's so much. And sometimes the text works in with the illustrations and it moves in these amazing patterns. What gave you the idea to, and it's a wonderful idea, but what motivated you to do that? Because it would have been a wonderful book anyway, but a book like this would normally have all the illustrations. Maybe if you were lucky in the middle and yeah. you have to go through the plates, but here it's all the way through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, because um, what I wanted to do was to attract a slightly younger audience at the same time. And I'm, I'm not talking about immature or I'm not talking about seven years or <laughs> whatever. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that um, the current generation, I'm, I'm, I teach English and I know how young people can never, ever read books. Uh, it's so common these days for someone age 27, 30 years old, and of course there are lots of exceptions, and right now they're probably thinking, no, I've, I've read thousands, I read one every day, or whatever, but no. Around the age of 27 these days, people often tell me, I, I've never read a book in my life, only once at school, and, yeah. and, and so on. And we're, we're heading in that direction, because with um, artificial intelligence, which I also use constantly these days, not for writing exactly, but for a lot of other, other things, you don't need to read to get the information or you think you don't need to read and at, at least so people are going uh, it, it's this age of google of course and internet people are going directly to the information they need they search for something they get the search results they go to that result they have that information they use chat gpt they they ask a question it gives them an answer that's the information that they've got. They haven't needed to read a 16 page of a chapter uh, or a long chapter in a book to, to reach that fact. And that's a, that's a new tendency now, that, that, that's, that's the trend. And normally I would write, a, I, would, I would make um, uh, an ebook version of this, for example. But I, I'm trying to steer away from this, this modern habit of, of just, looking at a digital page, looking at a, um, a virtual book in a sense, and, um, and not really getting any anything from it apart from the, the, those few facts that, 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 that you focus on. People, even, even when people buy a book, they, they just skip to certain chapters uh, these days. They don't actually read the book itself. So what I wanted to do was to find a way to make it a more enjoyable experience uh, particularly for, for new generations of readers. And uh, I feel bad about saying that, to be honest, because I don't, I don't want to, to say young people do not read. But that is what I find as an English teacher, as a teacher in general, young people just don't. So by using pictures, um, I'm able to, to make it more attractive. It's an easy read. Uh, you just go through the book very, very quickly. You're like, oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, there's a picture there and so on. And as you say, if you get to a page without a picture, it's like weird, isn't it? But, but the point is, I mean, I mean, it's just, just full, of, full of pictures all the way through. And at the same time, I'm very aware of the fact that when something is well illustrated, it becomes more memorable. It makes you think. And, and therefore, you start reflecting on it. And what stays in your mind normally is not a, a, um, a wad of text. It's not. It's not like five lines in a paragraph. What stays in your mind is a picture that you saw. Like, wow, yeah, I, I've got a picture that I just showed you. One of a of a bat sitting on a saucer, which I created. Um, 
people have said to me, well, that image has stuck in my mind. That association between the bat and the saucer, that's what people remember about that chapter. In a sense, it's like creating a, a meme. You're, it's, it's like a series of memes throughout this book. You're, you're, you're making these associations between pictures and ideas, and then you're using your visual memory to reflect upon it later. Because one thing I, I don't do in this book, I'm not dogmatic, I don't say, this is the only conclusion that you could, you, you could possibly reach, this is the way it happened. I'm constantly saying, channel your inner Sherlock Holmes, read through this with me, let's see where it ends up. At the beginning of the chapters on, on, on trap shooting, I say, well, we're going in this direction, let's see if you can imagine where this is heading. And I do that very deliberately. I don't want to tell people this is what happened. I mean, of, of course, I, I, I make a suggestion and I, I prove it pretty well in, in several cases, but that's not what I want to do. I want, I, want to, I want people to explore this. And the more visual cues that stick in your memory that you have, the, the easier it is to, to, to wade through that information and reach your own conclusions. And um, so far, I think it's worked quite well. People have told me that they, that they like this style. So I'm going to adapt it now to, to a, lot of the, um, a lot of the books that I'm working on. Like the next one, I'm going to issue one on crop circles, for example. I've, I've, I've just, wow. well, I've, I've finished it in a sense because I, I already published one in Spanish about five years ago. I wasn't happy with the result. And now I'm, I'm using this idea of all these sort of um, visual elements interacting with the text. And people are saying, wow, now I understand what you're talking about. Now I can visualize it a lot better. And I think it, as, a, as a learning tool, uh, images work really well, particularly for the, for, the, for the Google generation or the AI generation. Yeah, and even myself, obviously, who's, who's relatively technologically literate, but I'm certainly not of the new generation. But to me, this was such an important you don't often think of a book being a pleasant experience. I mean, you not if you read something other than fiction, which I very rarely have a chance to read, but most books which deal with facts, you think of, oh, that was enlightening if it was a good book, or that was rubbish if it wasn't. But this was a book, not only was it loaded with information, which I think I needed to know and everybody interested in UFOs needs to know, but I enjoyed every minute of it. And that it was excellently written, but that I'll tell you what, that illustrate those illustrations played a big part in my enjoyment of this book, because I've never experienced something like that in a book of this importance, I think, ever before. So how, how do people get a hold of it or how do they see what you're up to, Chris, anyway? Well, um, right now it's easy to, to, to find on, on Amazon, uh, where they can also find my, my, my previous book, uh, Alien Artifacts, which is uh, volume one. Um, Alien Artifacts has also got a lot of information that is going to change how we, how we view ufology and its roots and so on. I have to insist that I don't, I'm not saying that UFOs don't exist in these books. I'm not saying that there aren't mysteries out there. I'm just saying, let's focus on on real mysteries instead of of the of the of the crap that they tell us on TV and the, all of the misinformation and disinformation that that we get constantly. And in a sense, these books work as an as an antidote to to the nonsense that gets sent us through facebook or, or whatever you know so um yeah i'm starting to publish a lot of my findings um alien artifacts is a really important book uh, I, I i know i don't want to sound like i'm selling it or overselling it but um it it really goes does go right back to the roots of our belief in alien visitation without negating it maybe it, it's happened this is not the point and i'm showing how that has evolved through history and for example in that in that book um i show that the whole alien um ancient alien theory that was popularized by von Daniken that comes from 1823 and this is such a shock uh when when readers reach this point and they say what are you saying that there were books non-fiction books published in 1823 that said that maybe our ancestors came from another planet and that they built the pyramids and the easter island statues and yes that's exactly what it what happened that's exactly the case and it's the first book that's ever explored that and um shows exactly how that evolved 
from that point onwards and why it evolved. Why do we, did we come up with the ancient astronaut theory? There it is. I've explained it in that book. So wow. Amazon is, is what I'm using because Amazon is, is a very good place for me to design books using a lot of visual elements that I couldn't do using a, a traditional publisher. And I've published through Penguin and a lot of other publishers. But uh, what I'm doing as a, as a, as a, a self-published author, I couldn't possibly do anywhere else. I uh, People can contact me through Facebook if they want. Um, uh, I currently have something like 4,999 friends, and it's, it's constantly telling me to get rid of a few, or otherwise I can't add any more. Uh, so um, I'll see if I can I can sort something out there. I have, um, I'm going to uh, start a web, I have a web page I've never actually used, uh, but I'm going to do something with that soon um, and start putting, uh, books up there, new new books. Um, also through my group, Magonia Exchange, if anyone would like to become a member of it, it's completely free. You can access uh, several years worth of, of, of findings. We've got over 40,000 findings that we've that we've sent through the through the group Fantastic. very little commentary practically always just findings if mrs brown saw a ufo in 1863 or 1932 and 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 told someone about it it's probably in our archives so you can do all kinds of studies with this information we've had anthropologists and university professors sociologists and linguists using this information for their own studies their own documentaries and yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. And what I'm planning to do now, and I've started um, putting it all together, is to get the most interesting stories from our 20 years of collecting them, because we started in 2003, and um, turn them into thematic collections with my observations and, and notes and so on, uh, because uh, we've reached a point in which we have so much we, we need to share it. So you'll start seeing books by me or edited by me full of this quite quite soon. At the end of all of my books, I put my um, email address. Uh, so at the end of sources too, you can you can find it there. there. And uh, so that's a C-A-U-B-E-C-K at gmail com it's pretty easy to find so yeah I, I hope people do contact me I hope people disagree with me and debate this with me and, and say you don't know what you're talking about it'll give me a great <laughs> excuse to come out with more information and more proof of these things but it's mainly because we need some kind of movement to happen we need more people discussing these topics we need we need because we ufology is like this huge castle made of cards based on a very shaky basis, sort of very shaky foundations, and people are completely unaware of where all of this has come from. And if you don't study pre-Arnold cases, um, then you're only studying cases that emerge during the, the, the media circus that, the, that erupted from that moment onwards, which makes it quite dodgy information. Because in the last uh, 60, 70 years, people have turned this into their career. They've turned it into their only source of income. They're practically forced to invent and exaggerate a lot of the time when they do their UFO investigations, which, which are normally just armchair investigations anyway. <laughs> you know. So um, I think that the future of, of UFOs is probably in the past, in a sense. There are, there's thousands of years of it to, to explore. Which I'm, I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm working on a new version of Wonders in the Sky, which I did with uh, Jacques Vallée, Excellent. and um, I'm I'm talking to him about doing another version to uh, an, an, another period of time, the next period of time, in fact, uh, the, the start of the 20th century. Oh, wonderful! But I want to go back and do my own version of Wonders in the Sky and be extremely careful with data and sources and references because since 2010 when we published that one so much has come to light uh, that we've had to if i can just show, this is this is the, the the second version of wonders in the sky uh which is not easily not 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 easy to to, to buy for various reasons partly because it's 300 dollars, although we've never seen a cent of that um in the sense that it it costs that much to make so it was a it's it was a 
sort of it hasn't been profitable in any sense of the word, but that wasn't the point. We wanted to, to sort of publish something that was a corrected version, and Penguin didn't allow us to make a second edition of the book. Oh, my gosh. So um, we had to use a, a clause in the contract that allowed us to make a hardback version, and it had to be necessarily huge and expensive, or we would have had legal problems with it. So... Um, <laughs> Anyway, if anyone finds this uh, extremely cheap somewhere, pick up a copy. You never know; it could be it could be interesting. But I do want to make a, a new version, a, a new very cheap version of this, in the in the near future. I look forward to it. I look forward to all your upcoming works. And we, I haven't read, as I mentioned earlier, Alien Artifacts yet, but I obviously need to. And I'm sure we should have you back if you want to at some stage to talk about either that and or your upcoming books because you were just a delightful guest, Chris. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you very much for having me. And I, I, I hope we do speak again. And um, I'll tell you about my, my latest projects and you can tell me about yours too, of course. I shall, and we'll talk offline or off air, I hope too. So thank you so much for everybody listening. Thank you, Chris. And until I talk to everybody again, keep it weird. Mm -hmm.